play those instruments. Wow, that was awful, awesome. But boy, that piano player, I'm telling you. All right. Uh, <clears throat> Acts chapter 20. I'd like to apologize for this morning. I had a, a tickle. You ever get a tickle spot in your throat? I had that, plus I, I coughed and something came up and got stuck all at the same time. And so I was trying to give him instruction. And I don't know if I was even talking when I gave it to him. So I apologize for having to rush out this morning. So please uh, forgive me for that. <clears throat> so hopefully everything's all good and nothing else will, will come up like that. All right. If you would, let's stand together. And uh, I'm going to read down through verse number 12. And I'm going to read the odd. If you would please uh, read uh, the even. I'll tell you what. Yes. No. Tell you what, you read the odd, then I'll read the even because there's a bunch of names there, and uh, and I'll take the names for you. So I'll get you started on verse one, and we'll go down through verse number twelve. You reading the odd, and me reading the even. If you would please ready. And after the. And when he had gone over those parts. He had given them much exhortation. He came into Greece. And there accompanied uh, him into Asia, Sophiter of Berea, and of the Thessalonians, uh, Aristarchus, and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby, and Timotheus, and of Asia, Tychicus, and Trophimus. And we sailed away from Philippi after uh, the days of unleavened bread, and came uh, unto them uh, to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. <laughs> And all God's people said amen, right? Mm. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. And they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love and goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, for our church. Lord, thank you for the talents that people have and that they use, Lord, in music uh, to uh, bring us to a place, Lord, where we are ready uh, to hear from your word. Thank you for that. Thank you for those that are watching the nursery, for those that are uh, taking care of the kids' choir tonight. Just, just thank you, Lord, for the servant's heart of our people. Lord, I pray that you'd be with us tonight as we talk about uh, Paul, Lord, as he is at the beginning of the end, Lord, and uh, a lot is going to happen here in the last part of the book of Acts to him, but yet... He remained faithful, and we just pray, God, you'd help us to be faithful like Paul. If we ask this in your precious name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, one of the most tragic events during uh, President Ronald Reagan's presidency uh, happened one Sunday morning. <clears throat> it was the bombing of the, ba of, the, of the Marine barracks at Beirut on October 23rd, 1983. How many of you still remember that taking place? I vividly remember 241 Americans were killed and many others wounded as they slept. Many of us still can recall the terrible scenes of the, day's survive, of the dazed survivors as they worked to dig out their trapped brothers beneath the rubble. After a few days uh, uh, after the tragedy, a few days after the tragedy, Marine Corps Commandant General Paul X. Kelly visited some of the wounded survivors in a Frankfurt, Germany hospital. 
Among them was Marine Corporal Jeffrey Lee Nashton, severely wounded in the incident. Nashton, <coughs> excuse me, had so many tubes running in and out of his body uh, that a witness said that he looked more like a machine than a man, yet he survived. General uh, Kelly, near, as General Kelly neared him, Nashton struggled to move, racked with pain, motioned for a piece of paper and a pen. He wrote uh, a brief note and passed it to the commandant. On the slip of paper were two simple words, Semper Fi. Shorthand for the Latin motto of the Marines, Semper Fidelis, meaning always faithful. With those two simple words, Nashton spoke for millions of Americans who had sacrificed body and limb and their lives for their country, for those who had remained faithful. Now, Paul left Ephesus after the uproar. The last time that we met together, we talked about the, uh, <clears throat> the silversmith and Demetrius, how he had gotten the silversmiths together and they uh, were threatening uh, the church, they were threatening Christians uh, and things, but yet Paul remained faithful. From Ephesus, he went to Macedonia, then to Greece and continued on his third missionary journey. We see Paul as a man who never stopped to be depressed. He never stopped to be downtrodden. He just kept going. No matter what happened to him in his life, he just kept going. I think Paul very easily could have said, Semper Fi, just always faithful. And so we'll start tonight and we'll continue into next week uh, in a message just entitled, His Farewell Tour. He was at the beginning of the end. In verses one through five, we see his final uh, journey. <clears throat> Look with me if you would, please. It says, and after the uproar had ceased, okay, and uh, uh, if you go back up into uh, chapter number 19, uh, in verse number 40, it says, and we are, uh, it was the, um, one of the officials said, and we are in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar, there being no cause whereby we may give an account uh, of this discourse. Remember, the, uh, the whole city was, was crying out, great is Diana of the Ephesians. And uh, great is Diana of the Ephesians, and they were, they were just looking for uh, somebody to blame. Paul wanted to go in and try to talk to the crowd. Uh, the government officials who were Paul's friends asked him not to go in. Uh, the disciples asked him not to go in. And uh, in that, and then the Bible tells in verse 41, it says, when he had thus spoken, uh, this official, he dismissed the assembly. And so when everything started to die down is when Paul uh, was ready to make his move. And Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed to go into Macedonia. Now, Paul begins his farewell tour by leaving Ephesus and heading over uh, to head over to Macedonia. Now, the Lord allowed Paul uh, to leave Ephesus after the uh, silversmith um, uh, riot, knowing that the stability of the church was good. That's why Paul was there. He had been there. This is the one place that he stayed the longest up to this point uh, was there. Now, remember Paul in, in chapter number 19, verses uh, 21 and 22, Paul wanted to, to leave a little bit earlier. Uh, look back up at verse number 21 of chapter 19. It says, and after these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit uh, when he had passed through Macedonia and, and Achaia to go to Jerusalem saying, after I have been there, I must see Rome. And so he had planned on going, but instead of going, the, the spirit uh, kept him there. And uh, I don't know if he needed to go through uh, this, this riot, what the Lord was trying to teach him in that uh, doesn't tell us that. But instead of him going himself, he sent uh, into Macedonia, verse number 22, two uh, that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus. But he himself stayed in e Asia for a season. Maybe there were just some things he needed to straight out in the church. But now that the, the riot has come and gone, things have, have settled down, the Lord is allowing him to, to go. Now the purpose was uh, to tour, uh, he wanted to make a tour to strengthen the churches. Go back to uh, our passage for tonight. Let's look at verse number two. And he says, and when he had gone over those parts, he had given them much exhortation. And then he came into Greece and there abode three months. And when uh, the Jews waited, excuse me. And when the Jews had waited for him, he, uh, as he was about to go into Syria, 
he purposed to return to Macedonia. So, uh, what the Apostle Paul, well, I don't know where the map went. Is it there? Thank you. All right. And uh, Paul was here, and he needed to go up and around into this area here because he wanted to check on the welfare of the churches. Now, Paul uh, was probably planning this to be his last time in this area uh, to check up on the churches and stuff there. Uh, in, that. in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, we have a little bit more of what had taken place uh, with Paul as he started to go on this tour. Uh, it says this, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, that the door was open uh, unto me, uh, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother, but uh, taking my leave of them, I went into Macedonia. So when Paul left, he left on, on foot. Oops, wrong place. Uh, right here, and he just went right up here into Troas. If you notice, Troas, there's just like a little land bridge that he can get up and around to uh, to get into uh, <clears throat> Macedonia. And so he had planned on going up there. When Paul left Ephesus, he traveled up the coast by foot to Troas, where he expected to meet Titus. He had sent Titus on ahead, and uh, Titus had been ministering uh, to the folks in Corneth uh, to deal with some serious problems among the believers there. And he was, wanted to, uh, to meet up with him, but he wasn't there. But Paul... Uh, being Paul, did not miss an opportunity to preach while he was waiting and soon went on to Macedonia. Now, Paul and Titus eventually met up in Macedonia. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 5 through 7 tell us this. It says, For when they were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without, uh, without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforted those that are cast down comforted us <clears throat> by the coming of Titus and not by his coming only but by the consolation wherewith he comforted uh, you when we told us uh, your earnest desire your mourning and your fervent mind towards me that I rejoiced uh, uh, the more and so uh, whatever he sent Titus to straighten out uh, those things got straightened out and he brought to Paul uh, some good news so then Paul continues uh, his journey. Uh, he caught a ship and he went to Philippi, caught a ship, went up over into uh, here into Philippi and then down to uh, Thessalonica, Berea, came down here into Greece and uh, was eventually going to make it down here uh, into Corneth, uh, which is uh, Greece or Achaia. Now Paul was checking on the churches and uh, uh, that the Lord had allowed him to start. And as he went from church to church, as he was checking in to see uh, the things that had taken place, uh, the Bible tells in verse 2 that when he had gone over those parts, he had given them much exhortation. A lot of times when, when, when people believe that this is going to be their final time to see somebody, they want to impart to them some type of words of wisdom, uh, something to, for, for them to, to take with them. And so Paul, as he was going from church to church, was making sure that, 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 that they were on solid ground. Now, uh, Paul eventually made it to Corneth, and, and the Bible tells in verse number 3 that he spent three months there uh, in Corneth and uh, teaching them uh, uh, the word. Now, he uh, uh, was after Corneth. He had planned to set sail for home. He wanted to get back to uh, Jerusalem, which is way over here uh, in this area. So he wanted to sail uh, here from Corneth. would have been very easy for him to catch a ship and to, to come that way. Uh, but uh, the Bible tells us that when the Jews laid wait for him as he was about uh, to sail into Syria, uh, reading what had taken place, uh, many uh, people believe that, uh, uh, that he was warned of a Jewish plot uh, that the ship that they was going to take, that they wanted to kill him at sea. Now, if you've ever been out on a ship... And you've ever been out in the middle of the ocean? I've been out in the, in the Mediterranean Sea uh, before. Uh, you could push somebody off a ship and never see them again And uh, uh, in that. And so there was a plot to, to get rid of Paul. Uh, you have to remember, as many, as, as many people that loved Paul in this area, he had twice as many enemies And uh, in that. And so he had heard of that. So uh, he faithfully followed the, the, Lording, uh, the leading of the Lord. 
And the Bible tells us uh, in, uh, that instead of leaving from, uh, uh, from there to uh, Syria, he purposed his heart to go back through Macedonia. Now that's a lot. Now you think about it. That is a lot of area to go back through to catch a ship. But the Lord had a purpose in it. You know, sometimes we, we, we pray about a direction. But if we follow what Proverbs uh, tells us, to lean not on our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge him and he will what? Direct our paths. And they directed Paul's paths. Now, uh, here we are not told much about what uh, took place uh, during that time. Other than he had some folks that were, uh, were with him. And uh, we'll get to them in just a moment. But he faithfully followed the Lord's leading. He went back through Achaia to Macedonia and then sailed from Philippi to Troas. Now, Paul had two goals in mind while visiting these various churches. His main purpose was to encourage and to strengthen the church. He wanted to make sure that, that things were uh, still uh, going well <clears throat> in that. I would, would dare to say that uh, uh, there is a man sitting amongst us now. Even though he is retired from active ministry, he is still active in Cornerstone Baptist Church. He has a vested interest in Cornerstone Baptist Church. He cares about the things that happen here. Much like Paul, Pastor Mitchell is, is that man. There are just some, some things that they want to wa watch out for. And here uh, he wanted to make sure that uh, the churches were strengthened and uh, that they would stand true uh, to the Lord and they would be effective witnesses. But he also had a second purpose, uh, and that was to take up a collection uh, for the needy believers in Jerusalem. Jeru still, the believers in Jerusalem were under intense persecution, and they were having a, a lot of problems, and uh, they were really struggling financially. And uh, in Romans chapter 15, verses 27, uh, 25 through 27, give us a little insight on what Paul was doing. It says this, But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. For it pleased them of Macedonia and of Achaia to make uh, certain contributions for the poor saints that are at Jerusalem. It hath pleased them verily, uh, and their debtors they are, for the Gentiles have made them partakers of their spiritual things and their duty, <coughs> excuse me, also to minister unto them that uh, uh, in carnal things. And so we have here listed for us in verse number four, these different men. L look at it again, verse number four. It says, and he accompanied with him into Asia, Sopater of Berea. So you can look up on the map, and I know it's probably difficult for you to see, but uh, uh, there was uh, a man that came from here, Berea, and he had a, a collection from the church. And then uh, there was uh, of the Thessalonians, which is of here, Thessalonica, <clears throat> were uh, <coughs> Aristarchus and um, Secundus in that. Uh, good names if you're looking for names for your kids uh, in that. And uh, could you imagine Secundus? And uh, I just like that. Simba, Secundus. Is there a difference? I don't think so. Uh, anyway, and uh, in that. And then, then Gaius of, uh, of Derby uh, up in this. Oh, where did Derby go? Oh, no, Derby's over. Sorry. Derby's over here. And, uh, and so... <coughs> And then, uh, and then uh, Timothy, also uh, of Derby, and then of Asia, uh, Tychicus, and uh, uh, oh, Trophimus, and uh, uh, were there. And all of these men were carrying with them uh, a an offering. Now, these men were representatives of various Gentile churches, and uh, that had been started by Paul. Now, these men had been appointed to travel with Paul and to handle the funds that were collected for the saints. If you want to read more about that, you can go to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter number 8, verses 18 through 24, that these men went. And uh, the, the purpose was this. Each man was carrying an offering from his home church to take to the believers in Jerusalem. Now, Paul's strategy of having these men deliver these gifts uh, uh, with a personal touch uh, was, uh, uh, was a good idea. After all, here, here were churches that were started. Now they were caring for the saints that had sent uh, men out with the gospel. And uh, it was an effective way of teaching the church about giving. Because these men were able to report what God was doing in their churches in a different part of the world. 
I don't know about you. I look forward to having missionaries come back and tell us. As a matter of fact, uh, this, this Wednesday night, uh, we will have our missionaries, the Barlows from Slovenia. And they will come and, and, and uh, report to us and tell us what God is doing for them in Slovenia. Now, before they ever came, how many people had ever heard of Slovenia before? Probably no one. Uh, in the, the podcast that my wife and I listened to in the morning, and uh, there was a missionary uh, to some islands I'd never even heard of. And, uh, and, but there's somebody there. I'd never heard of, uh, oh, good night, Christy and um, Adam. Uh, Nauru. I'd never heard of Nauru. You look at Nauru, to us it looks like a very insignificant place. But to them it's where God had called them to minister. And so here these, these people were, they were coming back uh, to, to teach these men. So it was, a, it was a good thing for them to do that. Now these men went a different way, though, to Troas and then had waited to meet Paul. Now, uh, I want you to know something. Uh, here in verse number 5 it says, And these going before us to Troas. So in this time that Paul has come over into Macedonia and has come over into, <coughs> excuse me, um, and to Kai, he has picked up Dr. Luke because now he is not, he, now he is writing from a personal thing. He said, Us, Dr. Luke was now traveling with Paul and continues to narrate the story of Paul's farewell tour. And uh, we could see that change. Now, uh, as Paul uh, probably picked him up around Philippi, uh, Paul in his last leg of his journey to Jerusalem. Now, Paul must have really been happy because now back with him again was Luke. And Titus and Timothy, uh, the men that uh, uh, and the men that remained in Troas, waiting for him for a week. But his uh, those his fellow laborers were together again. Now perhaps uh, they were waiting for the departure of the next ship, uh, but they stayed. It says that uh, they waited for us Troas. And look at verse number six. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and came to Troas uh, in five days. So it took them five days to make that trip. Uh, from Philippi uh, over into Troas. I don't know how far that is. It doesn't look that far on our map here, but uh, you have to remember back in those days they didn't travel like we did or, or like we do. And, uh, but uh, So they are there together. Now, we see uh, that Luke is there with them. So we, saw, we see the beginning of the farewell journey. Paul is starting to make his way back uh, to Jerusalem. So then uh, the next significant thing that we see here in this chapter is the farewell service that they had. Now Luke gives a brief report of the local church at Troas. Now from it we learn how, uh, the, uh, how they met and worshipped the Lord. Consider the elements that were involved and we will. <clears throat> Look with me starting at verse number 7. It says, And upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread... Paul preached unto them. Now, what is significant about that? Where had Paul usually done his preaching at? In the what? Okay. And when they met in the synagogue, it was on what? Saturday. Okay. That was the Sabbath day. But they're not meeting on the Sabbath day, are they? The Bible says that they are meeting on a different day, upon the first day of the week. We call that day what? Sunday. Okay, we call that Sunday. Now, when Pastor and I had the opportunity to go to Egypt, and uh, we went to church on Sunday morning, very small crowd. But on Sunday night, there were a lot of people there. You know why? Because the Muslims worship on Friday. So Saturday and Sunday are regular work day, uh, work week. It's part of their work week uh, in that. And so same thing with the Jews. Uh, they had been at work, and so they were meeting on the Lord's Day. And, uh, and notice that, that there was a change uh, in that. They, it was called the Lord's Day. The people gathered on the first day of the week and not on the seventh day, which was a Sabbath. The first day of the week was called the Lord's Day because the Lord uh, had risen from the dead on that day. Now, we should uh, remember that the church was born on the first day of the week when the Spirit uh, came at Pentecost in Acts chapter number 2. Now, during uh, the early years of the church, the believers, uh, many of the Jewish believers, still remained faithful to some of the Jewish traditions. They followed the hours of prayer. And the Jewish hours of prayer were 9 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and at sunset. That's when they were to go to the temple to pray, or that's when they were to pray. 
But uh, as time went on, they moved away from the Mosaic uh, calendar and then started to develop their own, ta- uh, their own patterns of worship as the Spirit had led them. Then not only do we see the, uh, one of the elements was the Lord's Day, then we see the Lord's people. The church met in the evening because Sunday was a work day. Uh, as I just said, for uh, many of them, they had jobs to attend to. Uh, the believers... Uh, had to meet in an upper room because there was no church uh, for them to meet in. There wasn't the first Baptist church of Troas uh, that was there. There was a home that they met in or a place that they could gather. And uh, in that, the assembly uh, there, uh, as, as we know in that, that part of, of Asia, especially during that time, uh, there were a, a diverse group of individuals. But their social and their national distinctions made no difference. They were all one in Christ. That's the way it should be. All of us in here, we are from different social uh, and economic backgrounds. We're, we're different. None of us in here are all the same. But yet we can come together and we can worship together uh, as it should, uh, should be. And so uh, the Lord's people. Galatians chapter 3 verses 26 and, through 28 says this. Uh, excuse me, for we are all <coughs> the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For we are all one in Christ Jesus. And it should be that way. We should be able to to look across the aisle uh, uh, from from one another. It shouldn't matter uh, the, the pigmentation of our skin. It shouldn't matter what our social status is. shouldn't matter what kind of car that we drive or what neighborhood we live in. We together are Cornerstone Baptist Church. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. It's the way it should be. It's the way it should be. So the Lord's people. And then we see that they gathered around the Lord's uh, Supper as well. Uh, Look with me if you would please. It says, and Paul preached uh, to them ready to depart on the morrow. And they continued uh, speech until midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber. And they had gathered uh, together. And they sat in, in the window, a certain young man by the name of Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep as Paul had uh, been long preaching. And he sunk down with sleep. And he fell from the third aloft and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell on him, embracing him, saying, trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. And when they therefore, and when he therefore was come up again, that they broke bread and eaten uh, and talked a long while until the break of day and departed. Now they shared the Lord's Supper. Now the early church shared uh, kind of like a pot luck mill called a love feast, uh, which after they would observe the Lord's Supper, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Now the breaking of bread in, uh, in chapter number 7, so on the first day of the week, Uh, that they had come together to break bread. It's talking about uh, the Lord's Supper. They observed the Lord's Supper uh, together. In Acts 20, 11, it's talking about a a regular fellowship meal. Now, sharing and eating with one another, the church was involved in fellowship and also gave witness to the oneness of Christ. Slaves and uh, uh, who uh, were actually eating at the same table with their masters, something that was unheard of in that day. Because the ground is level at the cross. Uh, today, uh, it was the, the, uh, the oh, I don't know, it's, I think it was every, every three months that the Young at Heart class comes together to celebrate people's birthdays. You know what they did? They, they celebrated around food. How many people like to celebrate around food? Okay, all of us do. Like to break bread uh, together. All of us enjoy eating. And, uh, and that's what they were doing uh, in that. <clears throat> when we have our church uh, functions, whether we have a, a fifth Sunday or we're, whether we're celebrating our anniversary or something, we're all together uh, celebrating uh, around the table. But then we take a separate time to come in together and to observe the Lord's Supper uh, together. Now, it is likely that the church observed the Lord's Supper each Lord's Day when they met for fellowship and worship. Now, the scripture doesn't tell us or give us a specific instruction on how often to observe it. But it does tell us in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, 6, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till it comes. We must be careful to not allow communion or the Lord's Supper to become just routine. 
I mean, I, I've, I've been in, uh, I've seen churches uh, that have had it uh, every Lord's Day. And it's just routine for people. It's just, just a part of the service. I like the fact that we have been taught uh, the importance of it. We do it about uh, three or four times a year and take the time for the whole service to observe exactly what we are doing. And so they were meeting together. And then not only do we see uh, the Lord's day, the Lord's people, the Lord's supper, then we see uh, the Lord's message. <coughs> Excuse me. The word of God was always declared uh, in the Christian assemblies uh, as they would meet together. Uh, this included the public reading of the Old Testament as well as whatever uh, 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 letter uh, that had been received uh, from uh, the churches. And uh, Paul was writing, John was writing, Peter was writing uh, to the churches and they would read uh, that letter. The word of God is important to people, to the people of God. And the preaching and the teaching of the word of God must be emphasized. When we come, this is what must be open. This is what must be taught. We're not just here uh, to share something with you and uh, in that. But the preaching of God's word is important. The church meets uh, for the edification as well as for celebration. And that the edification comes through the preaching of God's word. Uh, when Paul was writing to Timothy, he told him to what? Preach the word. Preach the word. And uh, it is still uh, the admonition to spiritual leaders to do so. Now, uh, Paul preached a very long sermon. Uh, you look back at, the, uh, uh, at what it says, and it says, And Paul was long preaching. They didn't have short messages. When uh, Pastor and I got to uh, go to Egypt, refer back to that again, uh, uh, Brother Tim Long said that he was disappointed that I preached a short message. He said, because <clears throat> most of these people were used to a very long message. I didn't know that. I was just having a hard time through an interpreter uh, in that. <clears throat> I think I was still shell-shocked from the morning service when Pastor was preaching, and the lady... Uh, the man that was sitting in front of me got slapped by his wife for falling asleep in church. <laughs> I looked over at Jackie and told her, I'm awake. And, uh, <coughs> but Pat, pastor just kept right on preaching And uh, when that happened. <coughs> but, uh, <coughs> but they were used to, to, to long, long messages. Now perhaps uh, this young man fell asleep and, uh, uh, because of this. Now, uh, Paul took every opportunity that he had. Why the message was long? Uh, again, Paul was trying to impart to the believers that were there, to the church that was established there, and because uh, he knew that he wouldn't be coming back. But yet the people, even though it says that he was long preaching, said the people stayed and they listened. They stayed and they listened. Then we see the Lord's power. Verse number 9, we see some, a, a tragedy take place. It says, And there sat in the window a certain man named Eutychus, now, this young man's uh, name, Eutychus, means fortunate and uh, in that. But uh, he is sitting there being, fall, uh, being fallen into a deep sleep. Uh, why? Because Paul was, was, was long preaching. And he sunk down with sleep and fell, out of, uh, and fell down out of the third loft and was taken up dead. Now, when Paul was in town to preach, I'm sure that the room was packed. How many of y'all have ever been in a not very well ventilated room, packed? It gets hot in a hurry. The Bible says that there were many lights there because it was nighttime. So they had candles burning on top of that. It sounds like this young man uh, took a place up close to where there was some ventilation because I'm sure it was getting stuffy. Now, I, I can look across, and, and Pastor could, could testify of this too, or if you've ever preached up here, you could watch people fall asleep in church. I've never noticed anybody on purpose fall asleep in church. But the, the wording here says that, uh, that he, he just didn't just get up there and just went right to sleep. He was struggling. He was battling. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, you, you could sit and you could watch people just really battling to stay awake in church. And uh, in that. And so here this young man was. He was sitting there. But uh, uh, the Bible says that... Um, or, or uh, the, the study that I did said that Eutychus was probably a youth between 8 to 14 years old. And uh, since uh, the Greek word used uh, there uh, says that he was a young man or, and was also interchangeable with the word servant. So most believe that he was a young servant. He had probably worked all day serving. 
And he was there sitting trying to listen to uh, the Apostle Paul as he preached. But one thing led to another and he fell out the window. Now, <laughs> Sorry about that. And, uh, um, but I, I just, I, I, how many of you have tried to picture this in your mind? Somebody going, Paul, this guy fell out the window. And uh, in that, now we've never had any, any of that happen. I have seen one kid one time fall asleep and just went wham and hit his head on the, on the pew. And, uh, and you could hear it everywhere. And, uh, and everybody was looking to see who it was. Well, it was real easy. It was the kid going like this. And uh, in that, um, I've seen people go backwards and, uh, and hit their head on the back. That'll wake you up in a hurry. And, uh, but here uh, was going on. But look, look at what Paul did. Uh, verse number 10 says, And Paul went down and fell on him, embracing him. Paul was preaching, heard what happened, saw what happened, and we see a timely miracle. Paul interrupts his message, rushes down to bring the young man back to life, and uh, his approach was just like Elijah or Elisha. He went and he fell down on him and uh, in that. And then uh, Paul uh, went, um, uh, then Paul said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. Now you could imagine taking a fall, probably broke his neck. He did something because they knew that he was dead. But when Paul got down there, the Lord allowed him to give him the, the life back into him. But then we see a return uh, to fellowship. Look at verse number 11. It says, and when he was therefore, when, when he therefore was taken up again uh, and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till the break of day, so he departed. So it seems like Paul returned to finish his message. They had a time of fellowship together uh, around some food and no one seemed to mind the long sermon or the long time of fellowship afterwards. Now, I believe that fellowship is a very important part of a church. A lot of times we'll, we'll have folks here that uh, know they're not gonna see each other so they linger sometimes, just talking to one another and uh, uh, catching up on, on things. And that's a good thing. Fellowship is a very, very good thing uh, for us to have. And here the church there at Troas, as, as Paul is, is departing wisdom to them, they stayed and they listened. It's important. It's important when, you know, sometimes people are gonna be a little bit longer winded than others. It's important to pay attention. We need to make sure that we don't do anything to disrupt the service. You know, when, when the invitation time comes, it's not time to zip up the Bible. It's not time to put on the coat. Because you don't know who God is dealing with. And by us making noise or, or by us doing things to become a distraction, then that breaks sometimes the spirit on those folks. So it's important for us to, uh, to be aware. I, mean, I think one of the first things that we should do, if God has not dealt with us directly for a prayer for ourselves then we should instantly be praying for others. There's nothing wrong with, if you see somebody come up to the altar, you don't have to know why they're praying, but you could pick people that you know and just say, Lord, whatever they're praying about, just, just help them in that. Or Lord, you know, I noticed that there's a visitor today. Lord, perhaps he's not saved, perhaps she's not saved. Speak to their hearts. You could be part of that, that invitation. Well, here, the, and we're going to finish here tonight and uh, because I, I, I wrote the message, but it was like eight pages long. And uh, so we'll just stop four pages down uh, in, that, <clears throat> in that. Let's just end this way. Perhaps each of us should ask ourselves, what keeps us awake when we're in church? What keeps you awake? What keeps you listening? Be honest with you, how many, how many of you, let's just be honest, how many of you have fallen asleep in church before? And sometimes it's, it's just rough. But really, what keeps us awake? What, what, what is it? Christians who, who slumber for an hour in church sometimes have no problem staying awake when they want to go on a morning fishing trip. They don't mind getting up early or a lengthy sporting event or, or concerts. I'm not here to judge you. I'm just saying we need to prepare ourselves for church. We also need to remember ourselves uh, uh, physically, uh, get ourselves prepared physically for, for worship. I'll just end with this. Charles Spurgeon said this. Remember, 
If you're going to sleep during the sermon and die, there are no apostles to restore us. In that. Let's, let's stand together, if you would, please. All right. I realize tonight we're mainly just home folks, and I don't know what the Lord may have dealt with you about tonight, but really we're just kind of just looking and studying Paul's life. Paul was such a faithful, faithful man. And as Paul is going on this, on this tour, you, you need to, to put yourself in his spot. As he's going, he's having to say goodbye to people because the Lord has impressed upon him that this is going to be it for him for some reason. This is going to be uh, his last hurrah, so to speak. And, uh, and as we'll start to see next week, you'll start seeing people warn him about what's going to take place. But yet, Paul just stayed faithful. So tonight... Whatever the Lord may have for you. Let's sing a verse of invitation after I pray. And if you need the words, it's page 388. I would be like Jesus. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the Apostle Paul and the example that he has set for, you, for each of us. Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to follow his example. And, Lord, and for us to remember, Lord, that we are to bear the light of you in our lives. Let's be with us now if we ask your precious name. Amen.